Welcome to Understanding the Holocaust, Part 1, an interactive U.S. history tutorial for students like you. It's difficult to assign firm dates to the Holocaust, as some historians define the term differently and have different ideas of when it began and ended. The events of the Holocaust generally ran parallel to the Second World War, which spanned the years 1939 to 1945. This is probably the most common timeline for the Holocaust. Others focus on the later years, from 1942 to 1945, when the majority of the mass executions occurred, as the true Holocaust. Others expand the timeline to 1933, when Hitler first rose to power in Germany. The Holocaust was a systematic, bureaucratic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews and millions of others by the Nazi party and its associates. Let's break that complex definition down piece by piece. Systematic means done or carried out according to a fixed plan or system. The Holocaust didn't happen accidentally or by chance. Bureaucratic means set up like an organization or business with set procedures to be followed and specific jobs for different people to do. The Holocaust was planned and carried out with efficiency and organization. State-sponsored means that a policy is officially carried out by the government of a state or country dedicated to its success. In the case of the Holocaust, that government was the Third Reich of Nazi Germany, ruled over by Adolf Hitler. Six million Jews, about two-thirds of the Jewish population in Europe at the time, died in the Holocaust. Another five million people, made up of minority groups undesirable to the Nazis, were also its victims. The Holocaust was the Nazis' attempt at genocide, their attempt to exterminate an entire people. If Hitler had achieved his true goal, he would have murdered all the world's Jews, as well as many others he wished to remove from the gene pool of the human race. To understand the Holocaust, we must first learn about its roots in anti-Semitism, the prejudice against, or hatred toward, the Jewish people. In early 20th century Europe, anti-Semitism was a tradition with deep roots that went back many centuries. Jews at the time didn't have a country of their own, so they were a minority group wherever they settled in Christian Europe. Because of their religious traditions, Jews never entirely adopted the mainstream culture of the countries they lived in, which led others to view them as perpetual outsiders or aliens. At the same time, very broadly speaking, European Jews tended to be successful in business, in finance, and in the professional careers. This led to jealousy and dark conspiracy theories about how Jews earned their success. Many anti-Semites stereotyped Jews as being dishonest, immoral, and treacherous. Jews were also treated with suspicion and discrimination for reasons that went beyond religion. Being Jewish was more than just a belief system. It was considered in the early 20th century to be a racial identity. Anti-Semites spoke openly of the Jewish race, with its origins in the Middle East, and its inferiority to the races of Europe. Adolf Hitler wrote openly of this belief in his 1925 memoir, Mein Kampf, which was published well before his Nazi party gained control of Germany's government. Hitler praised the Aryan race, northern Europeans known for physical characteristics, like blonde hair and blue eyes, as the highest species of humanity on Earth. If the Aryan race was the highest racial ideal for Hitler, Jews were the lowest. He considered them an almost subhuman group, the cause of all Germany's problems. Germany between the world wars was a troubled country. Citizens of the Weimar Republic, the name for the German state from 1919 to 1933, suffered severe economic crises. Many Germans were angry that their nation had lost World War I and was subject to the crippling punishments outlined in the Treaty of Versailles. Hitler propagated a widely believed myth that German Jews had stabbed Germany in the back at the end of the war, causing its defeat. In the years between the world wars, far too many Germans were willing to accept this view of the Jewish people as a national scapegoat for their country's problems. When Adolf Hitler's Nazi party first formed in the 1920s, its beliefs were so extreme that many people viewed the Nazis as a joke, a bad joke. But by the 1930s, no one was laughing at the Nazis, in Germany or elsewhere. Hitler's official rise to power began in 1933, when he was appointed German Chancellor. He quickly consolidated power over all aspects of Germans' lives, suspended civil liberties, and eventually banned all political groups except the Nazis. In 1934, Hitler declared himself the Führer, the ultimate leader, of Germany. Going forward, he would make anti-Semitism the official policy of the Nazi state. As he gained power, 
Hitler moved quickly to strip German Jews of their civil rights and their equal treatment in society. Jews were required to carry identification cards at all times, with a special identifying mark, a large J, stamped on them. They were banned from serving in government positions, and those already employed lost their jobs. Soon, Jews would be forbidden to practice professions such as law and medicine. And to prove their loyalty to the reigning Nazi party, Germans were required to boycott Jewish-owned stores and businesses. In 1935, at the Nazis' annual party meeting in Nuremberg, new laws stripped Jews of their German citizenship and also prohibited intermarriage or sexual relations between Jews and ethnic Germans. The Nuremberg Laws defined a Jew in terms of race, not religion. Anyone who had three or four Jewish grandparents was considered Jewish, even if they did not actively practice Judaism, and even if they or their parents had converted to Christianity. In 1936, Berlin hosted the Olympic Games, and Germany played host to many foreign visitors. In order to avoid criticism, the Nazis dialed back some of their most visible anti-Semitic practices. Signs saying Jews unwelcome here, a common sight in public spaces before the Olympics, were removed. Still, the Nazis did not allow Jewish athletes to represent Germany in the Games, and after the Olympics were over, the persecution resumed, even worse than before. Jews in Germany reacted to these attacks and humiliations in various ways. All were horrified and ashamed. Some left the country altogether, but most remained and looked forward to better times. Germany was their home, after all, and it was, historically, a civilized nation with respect for the rule of law. As terrible as Hitler and the Nazis were, most Jews believed that these latest persecutions, too, would end in time. Hitler sought the aggressive expansion of his Nazi empire, the Third Reich, in the late 1930s. He rebuilt Germany's military while boldly ignoring the provisions of the Treaty of Versailles, gambling that nations like France and Great Britain, in their desire to avoid another war, would do little but object. In this, Hitler was correct. In 1938, Germany annexed its neighbor Austria, expanding the size of the Third Reich. Later that year, Germany expanded even further by annexing the region of Czechoslovakia, known as the Sudetenland. Hitler's dream of a rearmed, reinvigorated Germany capable of conquering Europe was close to becoming a reality. Meanwhile, his persecution of Germany's Jews entered a new phase. November 9, 1938 has become known as Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass. Across Germany and the rest of the Third Reich, including Austria and Czechoslovakia, more than 7,000 Jewish businesses were vandalized, looted, or destroyed. Hundreds of synagogues were burned, sometimes as firefighters stood by and watched. Jewish cemeteries were desecrated. Close to 100 Jews were killed outright in violent attacks, and as many as 30,000 others were arrested and confined to concentration camps. The Nazi party tried to pretend the Kristallnacht was a spontaneous event, the rising up of Germans all across the Third Reich against a hated minority. In actuality, the events of November 9th were highly organized by the Nazi party, its stormtrooper security forces, and the Hitler Youth, a Nazi organization for boys 18 years old and younger. Kristallnacht was a turning point, and many historians consider it the true beginning of the Holocaust. After, Jews found themselves banned from many public places, and Jewish children were forbidden to attend school. Why didn't more Jews leave Germany after Kristallnacht? The answer is complicated. Some didn't have the means, or couldn't afford to. Others simply didn't wish to abandon their lives, their homes, and almost everything they own to live as refugees. People living through history in real time don't have the benefit of hindsight like we do looking back. They couldn't look forward to see what was going to happen and plan their lives accordingly. If Europe's Jews had known that two-thirds of them would be murdered by the end of 1945, surely more would have left everything behind and fled, by any means available. But they did not know that. They certainly knew that it was humiliating at best, dangerous at worst, to live in Hitler's Third Reich, but most believed that the storm would pass and that better days lay ahead. As terrible as Hitler was, few imagined in 1938 that his eventual plans would actually include the systematic murder of 11 million people. Even today, learning about the Holocaust in retrospect, it's hard to believe that it actually occurred. Think about how impossible it must have seemed before it occurred, when there was no precedent for this kind of state-sponsored evil. There were other reasons why most German Jews stayed where they were. Simply put, 
Other countries did not want to take them in. Nowhere in Europe was safe from the potential spread of Nazism, which left the United States as the best destination for Jews willing to become refugees. But the U.S. was hostile toward immigrants in general in the 1930s. Immigration quotas that had been in place since the early 1920s sharply restricted the number of new Americans who could come to the U.S. and limited the numbers that could immigrate from specific nations in a given year. There was little interest in changing these policies in the 1930s. The Great Depression had left many Americans unemployed and without income for their families. If jobs were available, most people believed they should go to native-born Americans and not to foreign refugees. Anti-Semitism was also very much alive in the U.S. before World War II. Father Charles Coughlin, a Catholic priest, was one of the most popular radio personalities in the 1930s. As many as 30 million Americans a week tuned in to hear Coughlin blame Jews for the world's problems and praise the Nazis' policies. He was far from alone. The aviator Charles Lindbergh, easily one of America's most widely respected heroes, openly admired Hitler and blamed American Jews for trying to drag the U.S. into another world war. Lindbergh toured Nazi Germany in the late 1930s and even considered moving there. The Nazis awarded him the Cross of the Order of the German Eagle, the highest honor the Third Reich could give to a foreigner. Henry Ford, the automaker, was another recipient of the same award. Ford had published a series of books in the 1920s titled The International Jew, a collection of anti-Semitic fantasies that reportedly had inspired Adolf Hitler himself. Ford, Lindbergh, and Father Coughlin did not speak for all Americans, but their beliefs were not far outside the mainstream in the 1930s. And even when Americans were not hostile to Jews, they could be indifferent to the dangers they faced in Europe. In 1939, the year World War II began, the ocean liner, St. Louis, left Germany with more than 900 Jewish passengers intending to leave Europe for good after the horrors of Kristallnacht. The ship was bound for Cuba, but most passengers eventually planned to settle in the United States. But Cuba would not allow them to disembark, and the dilemma of the refugees played out on the headlines of American newspapers for days. The St. Louis sailed toward the U.S., so close to Florida that those on board could see the lights of Miami in the distance. The passengers petitioned President Franklin D. Roosevelt for refuge in the U.S. Roosevelt did not respond. 1939's quota for German immigrants had already been filled, and in fact, there was a waiting list, stretching several years into the future. An executive order that overruled the law and admitted the refugees would have been deeply unpopular with the American people. And in the end, Roosevelt decided not to upset the status quo by intervening. The St. Louis was forced to return to Europe. There, its passengers were finally taken in by four countries, three of which would be conquered by the Nazis in 1940. Most of the Jewish refugees wound up in concentration camps. 254 died there, victims of the Holocaust.